We want to see more dollars come in for research, detection, patient programs, and ultimately turn this horrible disease that turns families upside down financially, emotionally, and otherwise um, to the point where maybe it's more chronic, right? So that if you do hear those words, you have cancer, you also hear, yeah, but there is hope. Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation podcast. Join us and be inspired by the incredible stories of those who have faced cancer with strength and resilience and the medical professionals who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and ultimately a cure. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer. It's about the human side of this disease. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Welcome to the Believe in Progress podcast, featuring two guests on this episode, both joining us remotely, Rob Butcher and Matt Vossler. Both of these gentlemen are champions in awarding high-risk, high-reward cancer research grants, which helps provide funds for innovative, early-stage cancer research. In 1987, Matt Vossler co-founded Swim Across America, Inc., a nonprofit organization that raises funds for cancer research, treatment, and survivorship programs through a series of open water swimming events. He currently serves on the board of directors and oversees safety and risk management for 20 plus open water events. To date, Swim Across America has raised more than $100 million, primarily benefiting Memorial Sloan Kettering, UCSF, Mass General, Johns Hopkins University, the Fred Hutch, Moffitt, and MD Anderson Cancer Centers. Rob Butcher was the CEO of U.S. Master Swimming, which is a membership association for adult swimmers and triathletes prior to joining Swim Across America. Before that, Rob was a senior marketing executive with NASCAR, where he led business development and media partnerships. Rob swam in college and competed in the 2000 U.S. Olympic Trials. Swim Across America awards high-risk, high-reward cancer research grants with precision and accountability. Our goal is to provide funds for innovative, early-stage research that doesn't receive funding from traditional sources. In the 1980s, a small circle of oncologists sought funding for a revolutionary concept that the immune system could fight cancer. This concept was considered speculative and dismissed by most of the medical community. The belief was that surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation were the best treatment options despite their negative effects on the quality of life for patients and families. Physical, emotional, and financial, organization and commercial companies weren't willing to provide seed funding for new research and to take a risk on new ideas. SAA has awarded $100 million to cancer centers such as Memorial Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, MD Anderson, Fred Hutch, and the Dana-Farber so that their teams could innovate and develop breakthroughs in Im immunotherapy, cell gene therapy, personalized medicine, detection, and survivorship. Swim Across America's decades of identifying and funding high-risk, high-reward research grants were rewarded when the FDA approved immunotherapy treatments that Swim Across America had been helping to fund. Additionally, a recent high-risk grant is showing promise. In 2017, we identified and awarded seed funding to the research team that had an idea to treat rectal cancer with a novel immunotherapy. Join us as we explore the inspiring stories of patients, survivors, and researchers who are making a difference in the fight against cancer. This is the Believe in Progress podcast, hosted by the AACR Foundation and featuring Rob Butcher and Matt Vossler. Welcome, everybody. I want to want to say hello to my good friends, uh, Matt Vossler and Rob Butcher, and want to welcome you to the Believe in Progress podcast of the AACR Foundation. Uh, welcome today. Mitch, so glad to be here. Thank you so much for this. And we're here today to learn a lot more about Swim Across America from Matt and from Rob. And, and Matt, i um, really interested to learn back in, looks like 1987, uh, you were co-founder of Swim Across America. Could you, could you tell our listeners what was the purpose? What was the reason this all came about? Sure. So it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it really is a story that starts with uh, a run, uh, believe it or not. And a very close friend of mine uh, who had lost his right leg to cancer when he was 12 um, uh, decided uh, after graduating from Boston College that he would run across America, uh, much like Terry Fox had done earlier 
in the 80s. In Canada. And so right. I was part in Canada. Yeah. yeah, Terry Terry got three quarters of the way across Canada. Unfortunately, the cancer came back and claimed him. So Jeff really felt that this was something he wanted to do. Jeff Keith was his name. And so we, um, myself and four others supported Jeff. And it was eight months. And we left Boston in June. And we finished in February of 1985 in Los Angeles. And, you know, along the way, we all got into, um, you know, just this, this feeling of, of giving back and doing something, something different and, and then mixing it with um, athletics. So at the time, you know, we were all, uh, we all played sports and, but we started getting into triathlons and, um, and then from triathlons going into long distance runs, marathons, bikes, and then the swimming thing was something that was there. And it was a unique opportunity for us to, to do a new event to raise money and support for a local hospital in Connecticut. And uh, very original thinking, a great idea. We thought we would swim from Port Jefferson in Long Island, uh, nine miles across Long Island Sound into Fairfield, Connecticut, where we grew up. And we'd raise money for St. Vincent's Medical Center. And, you know, it probably would have been a one off and, you know, would have been a nice, you know, um, article in the newspapers, the local papers and so forth. But uh, <laughs> along the way, we managed to sink a boat uh, just before we started that event <laughs> on that funny, Saturday but... <laughs> morning. And poor Jefferson, a 28 foot sport fish went right down and we got a lot of press mm. for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> but that was our inaugural. And, uh, you know, the, the reason really was to, was to continue to give back, you know, using athletic events and really focusing more on the cancer you know, uh, world and, and research and support services. So, so how did swim across America then? I mean, that was the kind of the birth of it, but did that then you form the organization from that, that movement, the beginning of that movement? Y yes, exactly. So, you know, at the time we, uh, we brought in, um, and, and we were very fortunate to have this all, this convergence of, of people where we had, uh, Olympic swimmers like Craig Beardsley, who's, you know, on our staff, on our team, uh, Rowdy Gaines, Steve Lundquist. Um, and then, uh, you know, the second year, third year, we started, you know, bringing in all these other triathletes who also happened to be investment bankers and who really thought this was pretty cool to be doing this, you know, this swim across Long Island Sound to raise money for cancer research. So in, you know, year year two, I think we were at about fifteen or $20,000 raised and Year three and four, we went to sixty and then one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and continued to double. You know, and uh, it really it was unique. Uh, the the venue, um, the swimming, and remains today a, a, a unique uh, vehicle for for fundraising. You know, to 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 raise money. Very and, unique. And Rob knows better better than anyone. Very but, unique. Uh, it's and, and it, Rob, it's our space. Rob, you've had quite a diverse career from NASCAR to U.S. Master Swimming now to. CEO of Swim Across America. Um, before I ask this question, though, NASCAR, did, did you know a guy by the name of Spencer Luters who lives in North Carolina? It's 24 hours of booty, the, the, the bike ride. Yes. And yeah, I, Spencer, I think, is retired now, and there's a, there's a new gal that's running it there, yes. Okay. Anyway, I just figured, I, I thought I, I just, I, I didn't realize that you had a NASCAR background. But but yeah. tell us a little bit about your, you know, the, the whole reason that, you know, you're motivated and inspired to, to run this wonderful organization, Swim Across America. Yeah, I started as a volunteer, Mitch, and uh, my story is probably not unique. And um, it just allows me to have empathy with people. I lost my mom to cancer um, when I was at the height of sort of enjoying my NASCAR career, uh, looking for a way to give back and partnered with Swim Across America as a former you know, swimmer myself. And being able to use this platform to fundraise and then bring my media business development background to Swim Across America, uh, largely as a volunteer. And then in 2015, uh, while I was on the board with Matt, um, we had a, uh, a leader at the time, Janelle McArdle, um, who wanted to be a full-time mom. And she took a step back and um, they asked me if I would consider taking over for her and I was happy to do so. The, the really cool part of that story, and I think this just speaks to the culture of the organization, Mitch, and you've been around a long time. Uh, how many times does the CEO um, sort of step back and the new CEO come in and go, no, I need a clean break, right? This is my ship. I want to lead it my way, do whatever I want to do. Um, in essence, Janelle and I flip-flopped. She came on the board. Um, I took the executive role. And then just as Matt will tell you about six months ago, Janelle's in a great place where uh, her kids are now in school, that she rejoined our organization as our COO. Oh, and wow. so professionally and personally, 
my wife and I have twins, Janelle and her husband, Pete have twins. So there's a lot of, you know, sort of, sort of personal fun stuff between us. Um, but professionally, then we're able to work really well together and in harmony. And as Matt would tell you, you know, with 25 charity swims, we now have across the country, 10 million in active funding this year, over 100 million in total since Matt shared starting the organization in 87. Um, you know, we're really at the forefront of trying to fund high risk, high reward, early stage career investigator grants. So can you share some of that? I, I, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of high risk, high reward. Um um, I, I know we, we use support the work at, at ACR with the Les Garden yeah. Foundation, but, but talk a little bit about that high risk, high reward and, and why that is, um, you know, such an important part of the, of the mission and, and, you know, your, your focus. It's incredibly vital to us. And, um, one of the ethos that Matt had and when he and others started this was that money raised local stays local. So in the 25 communities that we have our charity swims, all those funds are partnered with an academic or a community hospital there to fund the unfunded, if you will. And it's just been important to us. And we think that um, that's where we can have the biggest impact for probably two decades. Matt um, can correct me if I'm off on this, that we were funding immunotherapy research, largely at Memorial Sloan Kettering, some at Dana-Farber. And, you know, frankly, in the 80s and 90s to do that, you were considered off the reservation. Right. Um, you know, the doctors will tell you, they've said it in their words, it was kind of quackery and there's other places that we should be putting our money into versus immunotherapy research. And then, you know, of course, when immunotherapy started to receive some FDA approval in 2011, 15, and then 17, um, Swim Across America was largely rewarded for the high risk, high reward um, concept that we've had. And as a result, that wind in our sail has allowed um, our brand to grow, allowed our importance to grow, um, allowed our influence to grow. And I think more um, early stage career investigators, particularly as they've moved across the country to other hospitals now, you know, Matt can tell you if we go to a, an AACR meeting, we'll run into a number of colleagues that may be at other hospitals that were previously funded fellows at, you know, Dana-Farber, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And they're asking us, can we start one of the charity swims in our community? Can we start a charity program with you guys in our community? Because they just love that ethos that money raised local stays local. Um, comes back to their institution to fund the next, you know, sort of Dr. Matt Vossler, if you will, um, at their institution. So Matt, um, Rob, as you know, uh, was uh, was at our annual meeting in Orlando. We were so, so happy to have him around. And Matt, I'm not sure if that was your first ACR meeting or not. It, might, it may have been, but uh, did you run into some of those, the, those scientists that you guys have funded over the years while you were there? I did. I actually had uh, three or four, uh, you know, great uh, meetings. And it was, it was kind of like, uh, you know, uh, spending time with these individuals is just, it's, it's just, you know, amazing. It, it, the, the stories and their commitment, you know, I, I think of Dr. Walchuk, for example, yep. um, and you know, who's, who's just now made his move, uh, over to Well Cornell. Just joined our and, board by um, the way, as you know. Yeah, he's, he's fabulous. And he's also one of our volunteers. You'll see him in a kayak, you know, in Larchmont, uh, this year, uh, sometime in July, but, um, yeah, and it, what's really exciting about this too is that it, it not only was uh, the model of the swim innovative and new and remains that today, but when we came up with this concept, we started this conversation at Sloan Kettering uh, back in the early '90s, and we said to them, "What's the biggest challenge you have? You know, where can we have the most impact?" And they had said to us, "You know, we, you know, institutions like Memorial and and." Uh, MD Anderson and Johns Hopkins and Mass General, uh, we, we recruit the best people in the world to come here, uh, you know, by far, you know, and they come from all over the world and they get here and they starve. Uh, they just don't have the funding. They've got great ideas. They've got innovation. You know, they want to take risks. This is the time to do it. And so we were very fortunate to, to have this model develop where, you know, funding the young investigator. Uh, getting them their start, seeding their program. It was just, you know, the model that we, we saw as, as a, a door wide open for us, and it remains that today. So much part of the AACR ethos and funding as well, young, you know, funding young scscientists, um, funding, you know, and, new, new and interesting ideas. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. And Mitch, we came to AACR because those same investigators came back to us, and they were the ones that saw AACR had a um, you know, sort of portfolio of unfunded projects yourself. And so guys like Dave Tubison and Jed Walchuk and Luis Diaz, they reached out to us and said, would you guys consider picking up an AACR grant? 
And so that happened several years ago. And then, of course, we have the, the high profile ones that are going on now, too. Yeah. And, 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 and Rob, could you tell our listeners a little bit about the, the story behind the, 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 the grant that we're funding, or at least the swim story behind that? Because I think it's a quite, a, quite an inspiring story. Yeah, and, and Mitch, we all love stories, so I'll take just a moment to share this one. Um, Elizabeth Beisel is a three-time Olympian from the uh, uh, 2010s decade, um, was team captain of Team USA in 2016. Um, in 2020, uh, day before Christmas, her dad, Ted, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And, you know, Elizabeth has been involved in our swim since she was in high school, so it didn't take cancer for her to come join our charity program. She's been there with us just as part of her volunteer service give back. Um, she reached out to us in January and, and let us know. Um, we offered to help her with some consults and you know they were being treated at a hospital in Rhode Island where they're very comfortable. But the thing that was most frustrating to her was um, that there hadn't been a lot of progress, at least publicly or FDA approved in pancreatic detection. And so that became a passion point for her um, she did this, uh, as Matt shared, um, you know, like running across the United States, incredibly historic. She did a historic swim uh, in 2022, um, where she swam from uh, basically the beach of Rhode Island to Block Island, which is about 11 miles. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, it took over six hours. She was the first woman to ever complete it. Um, you know, it made ABC, People Magazine, international news for having her completed it. Um, her supporters and family raised $150,000. And so that $150,000 she um, granted to us, 100% um, of it we used. Our board contributed an additional $50,000. And then, of course, working you know, with you and the team at AACR, um, we approached Lust Garden Foundation, and they agreed to uh, put in $400,000. So in essence, we created a $600,000 grant pot um, and we turned over to AACR and your science committee to run the peer review for us. And so one pancreatic detection award was, was just, um, just awarded, um, for a career science award. And then there's gonna be another one next summer. It's awarded both in the areas of pancreatic detection. And I think the, the sort of closing for the Beisel family is that not only did she do this incredible charity swim, but she did it in honor of her dad and she now knows where the money is going. She's able to meet the investigators and communicate with them. She's able to go into the lab and understand and express her emotions and feelings for what it was like for her family to have gone through this, um, you know, tragedy, um, but also come out the other side and say there's triumph here too. And that triumph is that my dad's honor is going to be carried on and we're hopefully going to make some progress in pancreatic detection, to be able to help the next families and other families that are coming forward. You know, I've been in the nonprofit sector quite a long time, and uh, I, I think it's so important for us to collaborate like this and have different nonprofit groups get together. Um, I, I think, you know, people, the public at large, when they're considering making donations, when they see organizations getting together for the greater good and, and really trying to leverage the dollars the right way, really makes a big difference out there. And it's not always been that way. And, and I, so I, um, I applaud you uh, for for being well. You guys are such a, I think, an entrepreneurial, you know, innovative organization. I love that, love that about Swim Across America. So um, I think it's really important, you know, as we just philanthropy in general. If I if I can peel back and sort of brag for a moment, um, I get asked what's been the secret to our success, and I would I would really say it's the partnership that we have with our board of directors and our leaders. Our our board is not swimmers. Um, they're not. They're not thinking every day, how can we create the next best swim? There are people like Matt who work professionally and have for 30 years in the search business, like our board chair, Pam Ryan, who's in investment banking at Goldman Sachs, um, you know, like our vice chair, Hugh Curran, who's general counsel at uh, you know, his firm in Boston. And these are folks that have been involved in our organization for 10, 20, 30 years. And I think a lot of organizations, I'm on my soapbox here for a minute, but I think a lot of organizations really lean into term limits. And in a way, we have term limits also, Mitch, but it's a two-year. And then our view is if you have a great board member who's contributing value and is part of the culture of the organization and they're experiencing value as well, why would you want to term limit them off after two years? Right. And so if a board member is tired, needs to take a break, we, Matt and I will tell you, we totally respect that. We'll help them. We're there when they're ready to come back. So we, I think, um, 
it's easy to say we've created a family atmosphere, but I think the reality is we've created a family atmosphere. And so because of that, our board trusts, they genuinely like each other, not just <laughs> at board meetings, but you know, when you're traveling to Boston or New York or Miami, you can pick up the phone and call one of our board members, go have dinner and even stay at you know, his or her guest home and go fishing the next day. Like it, it really is neat when people like each other are all on the same page and committed to the same sort of values. And, you know, hats off to Matt. And he would never say this, which is why I say it for him, because that was the value system that he established in the 80s and has continued to carry forward. And how many people are on the board, Matt? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you may not have the exact number, but just curious. So one of the things we've done uh, is, is, is realize that we, we started this all in the, in the 80s uh, when we were in our 20s. And um, so, uh, you know, we've actually started uh, a, a number of other boards that are local and more connected to the individual events and the communities that we have across the country. Right. Uh, and those are 24, 25 families as well as our board of directors and our, and our, our uh, corporate leadership team under Rob. I, but I would say, you know, and then we, we just started a young national board. So again, not novel or unique, but what we're realizing is that we, we need to get out and find people who are going to commit uh, and maybe just not say, okay, I'll do this for a couple of years and I'll move on and do something else. You know, we, we really look for people to make a long-term commitment to us and really, really feel part of this, um, this organization, both from a, uh, certainly from a fundraising perspective, but then also from a strategic direction. And it's important to us. So to answer your question, I think there's, I think there's, Rob, you'll tell me cause you know better, uh, I'm in charge of governance, which is not good, but I think we've got, uh, <laughs> 13 or 14. But broadly, I think there's probably close to like 30, 30 people it. who kind of sit in some level of, of board advisory function with us. I love it. Again, being in the nonprofit sector as long as I have. Um, and, and I think, you know, secret to your one of the secrets to your success is your is your governance and your board, your board, as you said, Rob, your board leadership. That means so much. And I, I feel fortunate that I have a wonderful uh, foundation board of trustees and the ACR has a wonderful board um, means it's a, it makes all the difference. Uh, and I know Rob can speak to I mean, that Mitch, as a CEO. You, Mitch, you know, I've been long enough, around long enough to know that the typical CEO or C leader like you or I make it maybe three to six years because of just volume of board turnover sometimes. And then, you know, as a result, it can be hard to hold on to continuity, consistency, collaboration, sort of. And then I don't know, Mitch, if we hadn't had this sort of consistency that we're in a position to, you know, frankly, have partnerships with the ACR and Lust Garden the way we do. Right. Um, it's because of the consistency and trust that we have with Matt and with the rest of our board colleagues. And, you know, as you saw, Matt's a volunteer and he was at AACR for us representing. Yep. Um, and myself and one of our other, a couple of our other executives are down at two charity swims we had on the same day. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's, it's all about partnership and collaboration. And I think as you shared, you know, it's a cliche, rising tide raises all boats, trying to make the pie bigger, but that's the reality. That's the way that we operate. And that's the way that, you know, we're here. We sort of, we sort of um, had this little internal saying, like, you know, we hope to go out of business, right? Because, right. or frankly, to take our very successful model and apply it towards another um, sort of epidemic that we have in our country beyond cancer. But, um, you know, in the meantime, we want to see a, more dollars come in for research, detection, patient programs and ultimately turn this horrible disease that turns families upside down financially, emotionally, and otherwise um, to the point where maybe it's more chronic, right? So that if you do hear those words, you have cancer, you also hear, yeah, but there is hope. So speak, there is speak hope. to that for a minute. Uh, either one of you guys uh, talk about the importance of investing in cancer research. Um, you know, we just came from our meeting, 21,500 people. We were so excited to get everybody back live and networking like yeah. that. And there was so much enthusiasm about where things are from a, a research perspective. You talked about immunotherapy earlier. And I remember one of our past presidents, you know, first grant she ever got was from ACR. And everybody thought, you know, what this was like, you know, science fiction stuff, right? Um, but this is where it happens. Yeah. So just from your perspectives, um, importance of funding cancer research just in general terms. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's just critical. And as I said, you know, we, we found this great opportunity, you know, many, many years ago, uh, you know, in partnership with Sloan Kettering. And the model that we, we followed, even getting more into the detail, Mitch, which I think is, it speaks to the importance of this. Um, you know, when we have arrangements, we have um, MOUs with our institutional partners where the money goes 100% to that program. 
All right. So it goes into the hands of the investigator, you know, the physician scientist into the program. So they get that full benefit. And, you know, for us, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's understanding that, you know, you have to be able to measure the impact. And, and we talked about this earlier in the discussion, high risk, high reward. You know, when you've got the best people in the world who are, are doing the research and they have an idea, they have an innovation, you have to be able to get behind them. And I know NIH doesn't do that. I know other foundations will not do that. But that's been the hallmark of what we do. Make sure the impact and the benefit is there. And really, you know, go out on a limb. Get behind somebody who's got a, a, a maybe a, a real novel idea, the next immunotherapy, perhaps. Uh, and so that's that's a big driver for us when we look at, you know, the importance of uh, how we're positioned and what we find. Mitch, I, uh, you know, in the in the for profit world, they call it angel investing. Yes. In the nonprofit world, we think of it sort of as angel charities. Um, we're delighted to make those bets, and we're delighted to see the collaboration and to see the progress that's being made. It's maybe not sexy because it doesn't instantly lead to a new FDA approval or a new detection treatment that's commercialized, but um, we have enough evidence after 35 years of doing this from our scientists that it really does make a difference. And so, as Matt shared, while we might be investing in MSK, that impact is not just felt at MSK, it's also felt throughout our country and throughout the world. So for humanity, we're doing something incredible with our charity and with our philanthropy. And we're largely um, sort of happy to be a bridge, right? So we can take the high risk, high reward seed idea. Um, you know, as Matt shared our agreements with our hospitals, uniquely, we don't ask for anything from our hospitals. We don't take a royalty, we don't take a license, we don't wanna participate in a patent. Um, we wanna speed up innovation and get the progress moving forward, whether it's to clinical trial, published papers, um, presentations at um, AACR and others so that information can be shared and progress can be made because Matt can tell you and I'm sure Mitch you received this as well in any month we probably probably receive I don't know 10 20 30 outreaches someone has been diagnosed with an XYZ type of cancer they want to know where can I go where's the best can you help me get a consult at this hospital and so it becomes a, a value priority for us where we want to help them. And we know through our research, being on the front end of that, it allows us to have a lot of relationships with oncologists and hospitals across the country that it's very fulfilling and spiritually rewarding when we're able to help out. I'd love to hear a little bit about a swim and even the participants in the swim. You know, what, what's, what's the demographic? What, what are the, they, they have to be inspiring activities. I know when I participate in events that I've done in the past or even now, you know, you meet these people that are wonderful, you know, um, uh, wonderful volunteers and people that are, that have, you know, moved by an individual that's dealing with cancer or individuals or they themselves. I'm just curious, tell me a little bit about like a, a swim, if, if you can explain. Yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll just start and then I'll let Rob kind of dive into the details. Right. But, you know, the, initially we began as this being some type of extreme, you know, uh, very challenging event. Uh, and, you know, so the egos were there for the young 20-somethings doing triathlons and marathons and so forth. So our, our first swims were, were a little bit nutty. And you actually had to be a really good swimmer, master swimmer, Olympic caliber swimmer. We would swim from Nantucket to Cape Cod, 28 miles across Nantucket Sound. We did that for about four years. Uh, we swam down the Hudson River. We swam from the Tappan Zee Bridge to Lower Manhattan before 9-11. Oh, wow. And uh, again, but the, the tide, tide, tide played a key factor in that. I Otherwise, bet. we'd be ending up, you know. Uh, you know, in Schenectady or someplace like that. But, uh, you know, and actually swimming under the George Washington Bridge was really, really something. I mean, you talk about a, if you're a swimmer, you got to check that box. And right. then one year we actually had uh, a couple people decide, well, hey, we did this last year. Uh, this year we're going to swim naked. So they all jumped in and they swam naked under the George Washington <laughs> Bridge, which had all the the traffic helicopters, you know, that that Friday afternoon buzzing about what's going on in the Hudson River today. I'm sure. Um, but the, but we really have gone to the model where we want to get everybody in the water. So we have the 25 open water events, and each each one has a very, very short distance. Uh, anyone can swim in that. You don't have to be a swimmer. You know, then we'll have kind of like a middle distance where, you know, we'll, we'll challenge somebody with three quarters of a mile or a mile swim. What's and a then generally distance, we'll man? offer up, I'd say about, about a half mile. Okay. You know, and if, if I'm setting the course, it's a very short half mile. So just, uh, you know, because we really want to get people involved where we run these events, they're very safe. 
uh, they're they're you know very very well supported with boats and kayakers and, and people and on paddle boards and lifeguards and lifeguards with uh, jet skis and and the communication is pretty intense and so you know we we encourage anybody uh, even if they're not a swimmer to come to one of our events because we'll have something for them to do and generally it's it's those people uh, who are our largest fundraisers. So, okay. you know, it's really, it's really interesting. You know, you'll get the, the big time swimmer who wants to swim three miles in our event and they'll come in with a minimum pledge. And then you'll get somebody who's going to struggle to get through a half mile and they're going to just blow it out in terms of the fundraising. Uh, the, the other side of it is that in every one of these events, we also offer a pool alternative. And so if people just do not want to get into a lake or get into the ocean, there's that aspect. And, and quite frankly, now we're starting to see a lot of the pool standalone events become very, very popular. I see. And that's another growing segment for us. So Rob, I'll let you fill in the blanks there. <laughs> Believe it or not, my iPhone and that vitamin D overheated, so I had to switch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just came out of our Tampa swim and it was incredibly unique. It was a half mile and a one mile option. and. Um, more than half the people, Mitch, were uh, new, not swimmers. Um, you could see tattoos on them, the temporary tattoos, why they were swimming in honor of a loved one. Um, it's very charming, less than 200 people, um, so not overwhelming. Um, you know, you could, you could see online Dr. Bill Nelson, Cancer Center Director at Johns Hopkins, came down and swam. Uh, Bucky Dent, bus baseball great, is on our um, advisory board, swam. Um, the CEO of the Tampa Rays came out and swam uh, with us as well, too. We had a kid splash, which was 100 yards long for kids who were under the age of 10. So it's a very family-driven style. Um, you know, you're typically in and out in less than two hours as well. And um, how do people learn about these events? And, and how do you actually select the cities? Or, or uh, you, you partner up, obviously, with some local cancer centers there. But is there a, a formula for doing that? Well, first thing we do is we direct them to swimacrossamerica.org or just Google Swim Across America. Um, and you can find us there and you can see our list of communities that we offer the charity swims. There's really probably three ingredients that we, we look for in what I call planting a new swim. Uh, and sort of in this order of priority, one is a volunteer committee, as Matt talked about um, earlier, that is willing to partner with us. You know, um, I encourage people to go look at Charity Navigator, GuideStar, see we have a staff of only seven on $10 million raised. So it's incredibly lean and thin, which means that Volunteers are the hallmark of what uh, makes us operate, and that includes in our um, local communities as well. So we need people that are willing to partner with us within the communities that are in this for the right reasons. Um, that will embrace our risk management policies that we have on our charity swims. Secondly, we need a great venue that we can put on an awesome experience and um, from safety uh, and so forth, um, experiential. And then third is we look for a beneficiary in that community, Mitch. Um, so at each one of our swims, you can find one that's either uh, an academic NCI cancer center or community cancer center that we choose to partner with um, that's going to lean into it. They can't just come and say, where's my check? And then we'll see you again in 365. Um, you know, they have to do hospital visits and tours with us. They have to do impact messaging with us. We want them to do a team in our charity swims. Thankfully, from Hopkins to Memorial Sloan Kettering, Don, they all do that and they lean in because um, they know as much as the three of us do how valuable research dollars are. And when our dollars can be granted to them on a research platter and it allows for that innovation and flexibility and we'll cover things like uh, you know, time and um, publishing of papers and traveling to conferences, things that otherwise would not be covered, uh, you got to find a cancer center director who's going to raise his hand up and go, I need more of you. I right. want more of you. So Matt, um, you should be uh, really, really proud of an organization that um, does all of these wonderful activities and raise dollar. You have seven people. Talk about lean and mean. Um, I'm sure Rob's going to be asking for another one or two people maybe after this conversation. But, uh, you know, again, I've been in the nonprofit sector a long time. To do what you do with seven uh, highly dedicated staff people is pretty, pretty remarkable. And so, Matt, from a board perspective and a governance perspective, that you should feel pretty darn good about that. Yeah, and, and, and we do. And, you know, as, as, as Rob mentioned, you know, we've had the continuity. You know, we've had the real commitment uh, literally since day one. Um, you know, when we, we sunk a boat in Long Island Sound and, and you know, started the whole thing. Um, it's, it's, it's people who really um, 
are there to support each other as, as well as support the cause. And we've just been blessed and fortunate to have, you know, the stick that we have, that the continuity of leadership and passion, and then to have great, um, you know, corporate leadership, you know, first, first with Janelle, uh, who was our first CEO ever, Janelle, Janelle McArdle, who's now our COO, who's, who's terrific. And then, you know, she really kind of worked her magic as well. There's more of a story than Rob will tell you in terms of how she picked Rob to come on our board and how coincidentally after just a few months, she decided to step down and we had to find a new CEO. And there was Rob sitting right there on our board of directors. We've just had that uh, continuity and passion. And, you know, we're, we're, we're blessed that, that we're, we're here today and, and, you know, looking for the next innovation for us. So what do we do different, you know, to even expand and, and, and broaden our reach and, and certainly increase the amount of money that we're, we're putting into incredible research programs? Rob um, and Mitch is a family yeah. affair for the Vosslers. Say again, it, you know, for Matt, his wife Pam, mm -hmm. it's a family affair for Matt and for his family. His wife Pam is actively involved in this. She's a UNC grad. She does a lot of copywriting for us. And um, you know, anytime I want to send something out publicly, I'm like, hey, can Pam take a look at this? And he's <laughs> like, yeah, she absolutely will jump in and do it. She's a volunteer at several of our swims. Um, you know, his kids have swam. His son Matt just ran the Boston Marathon wearing a swim across America. Um, you know, top, if you will, and was raising money. And so um, it's, and his daughter, Trisha has been actively involved in it. So it's a family affair for, for all of us. My kids are, you know, team, my kids are 12 years old. They're team captain, their own team down here in Charlotte, raising money, um, you know, for it in honor of my mom, their grandmother also. So That's it's, great. That's it's sort great. of, you know, feeds upon itself. So Rob, you have to know, I, I'm, I'm proudly uh, wearing a swim across America hat in New Jersey. Matt was good enough. He had two in his hand. I said, I'm taking one of them because uh, I run and walk a lot and I, and it's a great little hat and I'm wearing that around really, really proudly. Um, guys, let's, let's continue to do things together because I am just so in awe of your mission and of your innovative and entrepreneurial style. It, it speaks to me. Um, um, I, I have a, I have a, a, like a philosophy and it's like the, the five big E's and I don't think I can remember them all right now, but they relate to uh, entrepreneurship, explaining what you do, um, you know, having enthusiasm. Uh, that's three. I, I'm sure I can't pick up the other two, but um, we're so proud to, to be working with Swim Across America. And, and then just as a professional in the nonprofit sector, um, I'm really, really, and this, this, I felt this, Rob, the first time we talked. Uh, really proud of of your leadership and what you do as a as a, a CEO and a leader of a nonprofit. And Matt, having the pleasure to meet you in Orlando and and kind of getting the sense of uh, uh, where you guys are going and and now I know why. Um, it, it's uh, it's really um, uh, it's inspiring to me. And you know you've got my you know you got my word that we're going to continue to to work our tails off to continue to make an impact and and do all what we're trying to do, just like what you guys are trying to do. And um, for me, having you guys here today has just been a, a great pleasure and a great honor. And um, uh, Matt and Rob, can't thank you enough for what you do and, and for uh, being on the, the Believe in Progress uh, ASR Foundation podcast. Excellent. Well, Mitch, again, thank you so much. We're, we're so excited to be uh, partnered with you. And um, yeah, we'll... Uh, We'll think about some other new things we can do. Maybe we'll even get you get you wet. Maybe we'll get you in Let's the water at one point. So Let's do it. Awesome. Awesome. I see a dunk tank in his future, Matt. I see a dunk <laughs> tank. Well, more importantly, Rob, we got to win game six tonight, Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, uh, people, I'm sure there are Boston fans out there, but I am in Philadelphia. And Rob and I are basketball fans. But um, uh, again, guys, how can we learn more about Swim Across America? Can you tell us where to go? Just Google swimacrossamerica.org. Okay, and we will promote that in our meeting notes and, and on the website for this. And again, uh, Matt and Rob, great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so, so much. Excellent. Thanks, Mitch. All right, have, have a great day. Be thank well. you. Once again, thank you to our listeners, supporters, and donors. Remember, your support drives the progress against cancer. Once again, please consider subscribing to our podcast, sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org, to consider making a donation. Thank you for listening to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast. This podcast is produced by CollegeCast, LLC. Please visit www.collegecastpodcast.com for more information. And remember, cancer research saves lives.